noblest of noble ones, what an immense pleasure to have you here today. Now, as you know, as a content creator, I always look for things to present to you, uh, whether it be historical objects, generally speaking, weapons, armor, shields, and what have you. And I always look through museums, I look through iconography, art, something that I can either show you or have a replica made of so I can use it. Easier said than done. Generally speaking, in the making of my videos, I use either books, or I use PhD theses, or I use museum pages. To cut a long story short, let's say that we're looking at an object, say a breastplate. So the very first thing I want to know when I'm doing my study to prepare the video for you is what culture is this associated with? Is it uh, Central European? Is it Northern European? Is it Roman? Is it Etruscan, Greek, Japanese and what have you? The very second thing, the very next thing that I want to know before we talk about the thickness of the plates, before we talk about the shape, before we talk about why's and who's and what's, is what is it made of? I want to know what this is. And in this case, this is a titanium alloy, by the way, just for a previous project of mine. Not historical, but very interesting and very fun. Ow. Learning what a historical object is made of has become a nightmare. Why? Because of the continuous and ever most popular usage of the expression copper alloy. Okay, so the way we found a uh, Roman helmet in Gallian Arborensis. Very nice, and it's made of... Copper alloy. Okay, that's a very interesting museum piece. What is it made of? Copper alloy. Several of the helmets being part of the hoard were made of... I believe that the reason why they're writing copper alloy all over the place now is because either they are lazy or they don't know. And I'll get back to how we could know and why we should know in a minute. But when I'm reading a book, and I'm looking at a historical object, for example, a helmet or a hinge for crying out loud into Roman armor, for example. If you tell me it's copper alloy, you might have as well just told me it was metal. Yeah, sure, I know it's made with copper and something else, but if you don't tell me what that something else is, I don't know anything. Is it brass? Is it tin bronze? Is it arsenic bronze? What is it? I need to know. Now, I understand that oftentimes we don't know, and other times I think that a lot of these people that are writing these books that I love, by the way, so it's not like I'm attacking these people, please keep writing because I shall keep reading. But I think one of the reasons why they're doing that, the expression copper alloy, is a lot more common, it's because it's safe. It's safe for an author to write that a said historical object is copper alloy, rather than saying that it's bronze, or rather than saying that it's brass, because that way, if it's not listed, as it often isn't in museums, and I'll get back to the museum round part in a moment, oftentimes it's not listed, so they are like, okay, I need to know what this object is, but I can't, they don't say it on the museums, so I'll just say copper alloy, or other times they do say it in museums and they are wrong and I will show you a few today. And this really has to do with everything. I see a buckle, I want to know what this is. Shields! Oh, don't even get me started with shields! So I'm looking at Dura Europos finding, I'm looking at Viking shields, I'm looking at whatever, and I click in the museum page and I find shield. Okay, that's great. So I see all the measurements, I see that the, the, the wood tapers towards the edge. Very interesting piece of information. But the moment I get to the material, it reports wood. Is it pine? Is it ash? I want to know. I want to know what kind of wood. Same for helmets. I mean, a great museum like the Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art. I've been there in New York. It's fantastic. Probably one of my favorite museums ever. But the moment you look at the listings of the helmets and cuirasses and breastplates and, and, and whatnot, you look at the material, steel. Is it carbon steel? Is it mild steel? What's the percentage of carbon? Was it heat treated? I mean, all of these things really define an object. Because the moment you tell me steel, or even worse, copper alloy, I know almost as much as I did before. Now, I understand that a lot of people are going to come to me and say, well, yes, but some objects we just don't know. And destructive tests are obviously cannot be conducted because a destructive test, meaning you remove a piece of the object and then you analyze it in the lab, uh, those would immediately tell you what it is, percentages of all the different components. That would be great. But destructive tests, of course, are a no-no because these are important historical objects and you don't want to take a Greek helmet and remove a piece. 
I understand, but destructive tests are not the only ones. In fact, there are quite a lot of other options that can tell us what an object is made of. These are what are known as analysis by surface methods. XRF, X-ray fluorescence method. EPMA, electron probe microanalysis. EDS, energy dispersive X-ray analysis. Optical microscopy to determine the alloy composition. X-ray diffraction analysis to determine the crystalline structure in the patina or in the different coatings. And I am just scratching the surface here. And these tests have been done and would release us finally of this expression, copper alloy. Uh, when you're looking at a historical object, of course, the conditions are not the same as a, as a replica, modern replica. And therefore, you can't really tell what the heck that is uh, if you don't do the proper tests. Given knowing what culture produced that helmet and also what time in what specific period it was made, I can kind of have an idea if I have done my research properly. Because, for example, in this case, as I said, it's made of brass. Now, brass usage changes dramatically throughout Roman history. So in the first century AD, for example, brass accounted to 37% of all the alloys used by the Romans. Whereas at that time, I want to say leaded bronze and gun metal would have been something in the, in the lines of 27%. But as we move forward, the amount of brass used as a common copper alloy uh, decreases uh, to first to 27%. And then as we reach the fourth century, it will go all the way down to 4%. So almost irrelevant. So clearly, if the said helmet was produced in the fourth century, and I can tell it's copper plus something else it's more probable that it's bronze or leaded bronze than it would be brass oftentimes on the other hand of the spectrum there are many historical objects whether it be buckles whether it be helmets that are listed as bronze but actually are brass let me give you some examples look at the tampa museum for example there are two items or three items that are interesting in this case we've got two bracelets that are greek and then a roman strigil a strigil is basically a body scraper and they are all listed as bronze so we've got bronze greek bracelets and bronze roman strigil the part that i find issue with is the fact that yes the two greek bracelets are actually made of consistent values of eight percent tin 1% lead, the rest being copper. That's bronze, and it's actually a quite common percentage in the Iron Age. But when we look at the Roman strigil, when the, these tests that I was mentioning were actually performed, then we find out that there is no tin at all, and there is actually a 20% zinc. That's brass, and yet it's listed as bronze. Oh, I've got more. I haven't finished. I've got more. The same museum has a bronze bronze fibula assigned to the Western Roman Empire, 4th century AD. After tests were performed, the object showed to be composed of copper, zinc, mercury, silver, but no tin at all. That's not a bronze. Listed as bronze. Etruscan bronze mirrors I would definitely classify as bronze, so no label change in that case, uh, because they have, not only they have a, a reasonable percentage of tin, because Etruscan mirrors tended to have a higher percentage. They also include some zinc, but that's probably for preservation purposes, which is probably one of the reasons why it's found on the outer layer. However, the very famous African Benin bronzes, guess what? The majority have no tin at all, so they are brasses. I'm triggered. I'm going to talk about Vikings too today. The Stavanger Museum in Norway. If you want to look at some very interesting Norse-based, of course, objects, then that's definitely a place to go. But of the over 30 objects that are listed as bronzes, only a cruciform brooch appears to be actual bronze with a tin percentage of 9.4. After proper testing, all other objects are brasses, with a zinc percentage going up to 20%. Copper alloy is telling us nothing. What kind of bronze is it? Leaded bronze? Is it arsenic bronze? Is it pure tin bronze? What is it? And don't even get me started on tinning. You see, tin was very important in the classical period because, of course, it was one of the components to make bronze, which was what you used to arm your armies before the actual switch that many populations, such as the Romans, did with their armaments, switching, generally speaking, from bronze or copper alloys to iron. And the reason for that switch, you'll find a link in the description below because I made a dedicated video about it. But tin also had other usages 
stages, one of which is actually cosmetic. You can mix it with copper to make bronze, but you can also use it afterwards on an object to cover it, to create a patina that will change the look from a chromatic point of view, and which was fashionable. The problem with the lack of interest, I would say, towards what an, an object is actually made of, brought, again, museum curators to classify an object as an object that was silvered, where in reality, there was no silver at all, it was tinned. <coughs> Anyways, what I really wanted to do with this rant is, please let's stop using copper alloy. Or, if you do want to say copper alloy, which I'm absolutely fine with, I use it myself, but you need to tell me afterwards what copper alloy that is. So you can tell me, this object is a copper alloy, namely brass, namely bronze, namely what have you because otherwise i know nothing and i don't want to just have a superficial understanding of what the object is also because i think it is rather poignant understanding why a certain alloy was preferred over another because that could be a mirror into the political situation religious situation economic situation the trade where the conquests and trade disruption that actually made people choose one kind of alloy instead of the other there are many things that looked together with the writers with the historical events can create a three-dimensional picture of what was going on at the time which is what we are trying to do and when i and by we i mean all the great historians and litter passionate amateur me. Anyhow, stay noble, stop using copper alloy, let me know what the heck a, a thing is made of. This is made of paper by the way, and paper is made of trees. These coins are made of silver and they are props that I use for my videos, they look like Roman coins. Very nice. Yes, this is polished brass, which I find very nice. You muff it. Water. It's made of three atoms two at atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed this video, noble ones. I will see you again on Wednesday for a very special episode where I'm going to smash stuff into oblivion. I will be looking forward to see you there. Don't miss it. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. <laughs>